Hang on, hang on. You gotta wait for him to be recording. You are live with the App Show. Mike Agarbo here. I've got uh, my fellow app experts, John Beeler and Graham Williams. We got a cool show today. We're gonna learn a lot. Uh, later on, we'll have Shruti Shakar talking about TikTok, a social media app platform that probably most listeners don't know about, but it's a big thing with uh, the younger generation. We will uh, also be chatting with Brian Jackson from Infotech Canada. It's all about the research. Uh, he will be chatting about the Canadian government trying to tax digital services. So you know how we're all getting into streaming? They're going to be taxing that. Of course they are. Sometime soon. So we're going to see what the implications uh, are there as well. We'll also be talking about uh, streaming. There's a bunch of new streaming services available in Canada. Big one, Disney+. Plus. Couldn't turn on the news this week without hearing about Disney+. Plus, uh, But also Apple TV+, Plus uh, launched uh, a little while ago as well. So we're going to be talking about the uh, the pros and cons of the, the different services and what you should be subscribing to. But let's look at some of the, uh, the news. I think a big thing for me this week, guys, the Motorola flip phone is back. The Razor. With, with a vengeance. <laughs> the Motorola Razor, one of the, the bigger selling smart, or not smartphones, but phones, cell phones, do you know how many they sold back in the day? No idea. 130 million. That sounds about right. Because literally everyone, everyone had one. Everyone had one. Yeah. yeah. You either had the old Motorola Peanut, you remember the V120? Or you had a razor. And there were two defined classes there. You were cool or you owned the peanut. So <laughs> I had one. It was awesome. But smartphones came and we all wanted touch screens that could do magical things. Well, Motorola's married the best of both worlds. They've just announced a, a new Motorola flip phone. It's kind of like the folding LCD screens we've seen from Samsung uh, with the Samsung Fold and the Huawei Mate 10. Uh, but this one's doing it differently. It looks like a flip phone, but you flip it open and it turns into a 6.2 inch screen. So it's not trying to be a tablet. It's just trying to be a smartphone. It's pretty cool looking actually. I, yeah, I'm excited. Have yeah. you seen it yet, Graham? I've seen it, and I hate this less than I hate the other folding screens. <laughs> you hate it less. I hate it okay. less. Yeah. I am I am very intrigued. Uh, I wish Apple would come out with something like that. So it looks like a flip phone, but when you fold it open, the LCD screen unfolds, and you've got a full Android phone. One of the cool things I saw, though, is a little Easter egg that they have for the fans, is that you have the choice of a secret keyboard that is... Reminiscent of your original Razer layout with the little LED under lighting and all that type of stuff. So you can go back to the original Razer feel or you can have a full screen. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can go to the pawn shop and just get a Razer. Yeah. For $10. <laughs> <laughs> so this also, when it's folded, also has a little two inch screen on the outside. Uh, so you don't have to open it fully if you want to check notifications and messages. And you can even use it as a little uh, screen for taking selfies. Honestly, that's not a that's not a bad thing. Like I use my Apple Watch for that right now, being able to just really quickly check my notifications. So that's that's handy. Yep. I mean, this brings back the the number one thing that I've always looked for in a cell phone, and that is feeling like Captain Kirk when I use it. It is cool. Okay, two to so, beam up, <laughs> guys. Sounds cool, right? Yep. We're excited, but wait, it's two thousand dollars. Oh my lord, really? It's yeah. two thousand dollars. Yep. I do, what, <laughs> John? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that is a lot of money. Well. Yeah. Two thousand bucks. Now, Would you, you spend two thousand dollars on a folding razor phone? Hell no. No. Now, can you can you pay credit card for this, or are they actually asking for a sack full of money with a dollar sign on the side? That's ridiculous. Well, it's. I mean, with new technology, it's always expensive. I, I tell you though, I think a lot of people will pick this up. Yeah, I think more so than like the Samsung folding tablet. Phone. Well, it's got the n nostalgia built yeah, in. Yeah, but it, it looks. Can I tell you? It looks practical. Like, I love the engineering and the technology behind Huawei and Samsung's folding tablet slash smartphone, but they're huge and bulky. I just couldn't see myself carrying around that thing all day. Whereas this is more pocketable. It's, yeah, it's yeah. like out of the gate, it's usable. Okay, so if you put a gun to my head and I had to pick a folding phone, I'd pick the razor. <laughs> Thanks, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Also in gun. also in the news, uh, really neat article uh, over on TheVerge.com about artificial intelligence. As we know, AI or artificial intelligence is getting smarter and smarter. It is everywhere. But now they're asking who owns the content of uh, a computer with artificial intelligence 
makes, you know, if they make a, a painting or they write a poem or a play or a movie, which or ha- we're, we're getting there. Or have the playlist on Spotify. Yeah. So who, who owns that? Well, the interesting thing in the article is that the U.S. Patent Office is actually asking for people to comment and what they think is the answer to this. Because it's it's a pretty complex... I like when the Patent Office is asking people. Because no one knows. Because they don't know. Right. Well, they don't even know where to begin. It's, un, it's completely uncharted territory. And it brings up a lot of interesting implications with stuff. Because AI, there's a lot of... you know We've talked about a lot of fun AI, AI apps that help you create little pieces of art or something like that. But quite often they're derivative from something else, right? Mm. You start off with a Picasso photo and you turn, you know, your selfie into that Picasso photo. So it's inspired by Picasso, but it's generated by a computer, but you didn't actually generate it. You maybe chose a couple of variables, but at the end of the day... But if you hit the start button, I would say you own it. You know, here, here's the thing. If, if we're looking at a style of someone who is currently living. So say, for example, um, you know, I put a bunch of Scrabble letters uh, into uh, an AI program and got the next Dan Brown novel out, <laughs> which is pretty likely, actually. Um, you know, oh, I would say that burn. Dan actually probably, if, if it's in that style and it's not sufficiently different from things that that person has created, I think at that point you are infringing on that person's, um, you know, creative license and their copyright. Um, you know, we're, right now we're in a position where we've had a number of corporations that have pushed for copyright to be extended to ridiculous periods. Yeah. You know, Mickey Mouse, for example, has been extended 70 plus years past the death of Walt Disney. It's nuts. Um, so, you know, at that point, I start to look at it and say, okay, if we're looking at infringing on the copyright of an estate, I'm a, I'm a little less concerned. And if it is something that is uh, no longer... Uh, under copyright. It's not a concern at all. Um, ultimately, though, and I think to Mike's point, um, if you have had more interaction with it than just hitting start, if you've had some interaction with the program, some guidance of the AI, you've adjusted parameters, then I think probably you own the copyright. Um, but if it is literally just hitting a button on an app, is that even copyrightable at this point? Or the what What if it's the person that wrote the soft, the AI software? And that's an interesting one because I think a lot of people at that point, knowing that, you know, if they created something and it went to the owner or the, you know, the person that coded it, um, you probably wouldn't use that AI, right? I know I wouldn't if I was going to create something and it well, went to it, somebody Well, it depends else. what the end use is, but also quite often people will create something and it'll go viral for some weird reason. And then all of a sudden the questions come up, well, who actually owns this? Who's going to get the royalties from the usage of this photo or this image or this music that's been generated by a computer. And where's the line drawn in the sand, right? Because, you know, right now I can use the YouTube app to shoot video on my phone and then I can hit a button to automatically adjust the color and the audio and add in closed captions. And that's being done with some smart machine learning and some AI. Um, I was still in this video. Does YouTube own AI copyright? Heck no. So there is definitely a line there somewhere. Yeah. And I think it's pushed further to the, you didn't have any interaction with this. You hit a button. Let's move on to another story. Uh, Facebook in the news again. Shocking. I'm almost tired of <laughs> doing Facebook news because it's always something stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about it. Okay. If you use Facebook on an iOS device uh, and specifically uh, iPhones running iOS version 13.2.2. Write that one down. Uh, apparently, uh, some users uh, found that when they were scrolling through their news feed, the camera would activate on your phone. Yeah, you could only see it for a flash second if you rotated the display. Okay. Uh, and then you would see that the camera was shooting through and you could see that the camera was activated. Uh, apparently, a number of people actually tested a few things where they revoked privileges from the Facebook app to access the camera and it was a black display when they were able to recreate it. So it, it was an actual fact turning the camera on. It was turning the camera on it, but there's no proof or evidence that it actually took any photos and transmitted them anywhere. I'm just concerned as to why that code was in there. What, what, what flag triggered that feature of the app? Well, of, of course, as you would expect, Facebook has said that it, they fixed one bug and it created a new bug. Yeah. You know, I'm actually going to go in right now and revoke permissions. <laughs> I'm kind of tired of this. Good old Facebook. Okay, we're going to have to take a break. When we come back, we will be talking about streaming services. There's so many now. What do you pick? It, it's adding up, man. 
remember everyone like, oh, I cut cable, I'm saving all this money. Ha <laughs> ha Well, now you're spending a lot of money on all the subscriptions. Uh, so we'll give you uh, our opinions on what the best ones are. We'll also be talking about uh, the government here in Canada trying to tax these services. And we'll get uh, all the info on that. Let's talk about streaming today. So many choices. Well, not like so many, but there's a few choices. Uh, I kind of laugh now at all the people that have uh, been high-fiving themselves for cutting the cord, you know, getting rid of cable. Well, now that bill for content is getting right up there. So you're high-fiving yourself? I No, I have cable still. Do <laughs> <laughs> you know what's sad? I thought you cut it all. I did, but then they phoned me and, and gave me this cut-rate deal. That was so cheap, and they said, well, you got to take cable as well. I'm like, I don't use it. And like, well, you're going to have it. I said no. Anyway, so I have cable. So this is a funny thing. I have cable, but all the boxes are in my garage. That, that's why I said no. So I'm paying $112 a month right now. Yes, so show. am I. So am I. And they offered me 107 if I would take the box. I'm like, you're basically asking to rent space in my house for $7 and $6 a month uh, for me to hang on to that box. I don't. I don't want it. Yeah, so I've got cable, I've got the home phone, and I've got like high high speed internet. Yeah, around that. Yeah, and but so I just yeah I don't so, know why I have them in my garage. So what are you paying right now for streaming? <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> this is where it gets complicated. <laughs> okay, so I just have Netflix right now. I haven't um, subscribed yet to Apple TV Plus or uh, Disney Plus. Really? Because because you just got a new iPhone. Yeah, so yeah. you get an Apple TV Plus you for free. You get Apple TV Plus for free. So here, here's where I am. Bonus. <laughs> <laughs> here's where I am. I am on the Netflix 4K plan. So that's 17? 14. 14, okay. 14 dollars a month. Yeah. Um, I am on Crave, yeah. which is $9 a month. I'm on the HBO add-on for Crave, which is another $10 a month. 33, okay. Okay. Um, I've got Disney Plus, which is another nine bucks a month. You over 42. 42. Yeah. Uh, I've got Spotify on the family plan, 15. Okay, 57. Okay, I've got uh, Apple Music on the family, family plan. plan. It's another 15. Yeah, sorry, 67, 78, 72. I'm somewhere around $72. I've got Apple TV Plus, but it's free because I've got my- But if you were paying for it, and you, will you pay for it when it- you know, that remains to be seen because uh, I've, I've got it. I haven't watched a single thing. There's only six yet. shows to watch. Yeah. They're good. They're good. I've watched The Morning Show and I've watched For All Mankind. They're they're quite excellent. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to give that but a okay, go this so, weekend. But stop for a second. Yes. You're up at 70, 70 75 bucks yes. in streaming. Yeah. Cable's looking pretty good. It's not though. Right, because with cable, I have to make an appointment with cable, or I have to manage all of that crap you don't, on PVR. Though, because they have it all on demand now. Yeah, the yeah. interface is terrible. Terrible. Sure. Sure. Well, no, the the newer interfaces, the the on demand stuff, the interfaces are, we're gonna say better. Uh, so so now I've got to take up another HDMI on my TV, and yeah. I've got to have another remote. <laughs> Oh, the struggle is real, Graham. <laughs> I live in a thousand square feet in the downtown east side. I got no space for this. So, but you've so, got Sonos every corner. <laughs> well, yeah, that's why I've got no space for this. <laughs> okay, so between your, your TV and movies and music subscriptions, yes. and in fairness, you've got family plans. Yes. Because you're sharing that with your supposed family. Yes, that's right. Yes. <laughs> You'll find it on Craigslist. The inflatable yeah. <laughs> dolls that I call mom, dad, and partner. Yeah. Uh, so you're up there, buddy. Yeah, I am. Yeah. But that's the thing. That's though, what is... I've been telling people. Like, oh, the cable companies are dead. You know, the, the broadcasters are dead. I'm like, no. It's just going to come out a different way. So this is the thing, and though. And here it is. My, my experience, though, is so much better than it used to be, right? I can use Siri on my Apple TV. Just say the name of a TV show or a movie, and it pops up with whichever streaming service that it is and takes me to it and plays it. So I now have access to this massive library, no commercials, no searching, no thinking. Somebody mentions something to me. They're like, hey, you should go watch For All Mankind. And I go, hey, Siri. Um... I want to watch you just for all mankind. All the Apple devices here. I just yeah. set off mine because Siri's good enough to know. Okay, that. so what what do we recommend to listeners out there? I mean, you're up at seventy five bucks. You yes. don't need Spotify and Apple Music. I don't. Pick, well, you know, pick I, one. So here's the thing. I actually I have both because all I have of both my as well. So <laughs> all of my DJ <laughs> friends either. are on Spotify, right? But my family likes Apple Music, so that was sort of a. I'm. Oh, you have Amazon too, so I forgot that. I've got Amazon Prime. That's right. Yeah, you're over eighty dollars. Yeah. Well, but, but here's the thing is I don't really consider Amazon Prime there because I've got it for the shipping. It's just yeah. sort of the, 
bonus. It's the bonus. Like yeah. Jeff Bezos going, hey, you know what? Here's a couple of bucks from me down from on my high tower of cash. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. so, yeah, but seriously, you're over 80 bucks in so, streaming. So this is the thing though, is I have, this is actually me at the height of TV season getting everything right now because content that I want is coming out on these things. In the summer, do you know how many streaming services I had? Two. I had Apple Music and I had Spotify because I wasn't home to watch TV. You, did you kill Netflix? I killed Netflix. I killed Crave. I killed everything except Amazon because I need it for the shipping. Okay. So for people out there, uh, let's not talk about music. Let's talk about TV and movie content. Yes. What would you recommend? Uh, if you, you had to pick one. If, you, if you've got kids, right? And if, you've got, if you like Star Wars and Marvel, uh, Disney Plus is looking really, really good right now. Um, yeah, but that's if you're, I mean, it's just Star Wars and kids stuff. Yeah, but I've got to tell you, the it's more of, than that. Yeah, they've got amazing okay, documentaries the, the on there, and all the Simpsons. Yeah, they've got like phenomenal. Like, oh, they've got all the National Geographic content. Yeah, the National Geographic actually surprised me. Yeah, uh, One Strange Rock with Will Smith. Watched the mm, first episode. Really okay. liked it. It's okay. Yeah. So, um, so that's good. I mean, Netflix is putting out some really great original content right now. So, watch some trailers. See what you think. I've got to say though, and I never thought I would come down on the side of Bell on something because, yeah, but. Crave actually presents a ton of really good value if you tack on HBO and or Showtime. So that makes it 20 bucks a month. Uh, with actually, with both of them, it's 30. 30, that's a lot of money. Right? And I think you can even add on another like movie channel plus for another $10. But, but let's just put this in context. One movie at the theater can be 50 bucks for two people to go out for one night. You know the last time I was in the theater? Neither do I. <laughs> I was in the theater on the weekend. So I, I, I've you know what I got? Money. I have the scenes reward card. Yeah. And they actually sent me an email saying, hey, we're going to give you enough points to get you a free movie. Because <laughs> we miss you. Yeah. Please come back. No. Anyway, I gave it to my kids. They used it. But I, obviously, they're, uh, they're feeling the pain. Yeah. Okay. So Netflix. Netflix. Disney Plus. Yeah, I would say if you've got kids, Disney Plus. If you like original content, Netflix is pretty cool. And if you're looking for stuff that's probably on TV right now, Crave Great. is a good way to go. Okay. We're going to have to take a break. We're going to make that streaming even more expensive now because the government wants its cut. We'll be talking with Brian Jackson from Infotech Canada about what the Canadian government's doing about taxing streaming services and digital services. Let's talk about tax. More tax. I love taxes. Uh, and especially when it comes to the, the digital services that we're all really eagerly chomping up now. Netflix, I think, is in most... Canadian households. Disney Plus is uh, has launched uh, as well. I think that's another eight ninety nine a month. There's so many different ones. Yeah, it's all Crave TV. You name it, it's out there. The government is talking about taxing these now as well to raise money for God knows what content. Canadian content, I think, is one thing. Right, because there's so much content that's not Canadian made. Exactly. Although, ironically, it's a lot of it's filmed in Vancouver, so. <laughs> By the Americans. Well, to help us understand what it's all about, we've got our good friend uh, from the Infotech Research Group, Brian Jackson. Thanks for joining us, Brian. Yeah, glad to be here. So explain to our listeners uh, what's happening. Uh, the government has been talking about instituting a tax on the digital services. Yeah, so during the federal election campaign that we've just been through, tech innovation and the tech regulation space really didn't feature too highly in the discussion. But if you dig through the policy platforms of the different parties, uh, the Liberal Party and the NDP both agree that there should be this new 3% tax on all digital uh, services, like digital subscription services and uh, ads that are targeted through digital platforms. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, to explain that in layman's terms, you're looking at a 3% tax on your Netflix bill and on Facebook ads that are purchased. I want to pay more <laughs> for, for Netflix, but okay. So yeah, that well, sucks. it'll actually be uh, charged to the companies that are collecting the revenue, right? But we can assume that that would be passed on to the consumers. Oh yeah, <laughs> it always is. So Brian, this is interesting. So what are they going to do with that money? I think is the important thing. Is it going into general revenues or are they going to allocate it for, for example, Canadian content creation? Yeah, I think this, this would go to general revenue because we're talking about a 3% tax across the board. And when we talk about these firms that are um, like Google, Facebook, 
Netflix, Disney Plus, right? These digital services that we are consuming more of all the time. People forget that these services don't even charge HST. So somehow there's they found this loophole where they can sell something to you um, in Canada that you can pay a monthly bill on, and you're not paying that 13% tax that you would pay on your cable bill or on your cell phone bill. And uh, yet, you, you know, they're able to just get by tax free. So this is actually a problem that's not unique to Canada. All of the OECD countries are trying to figure out what they're going to do to tax companies like this. And in the meantime, the Liberals and NDP are suggesting that hey, let's just put in this 3% tax, start raising some money when the all these other international countries figure out a unified approach, we'll do what everybody else is doing. But until then, 3% tax. And it could raise a lot of money, right? Uh, we're talking about half a billion dollars in the first year. Really? Yeah, that much. That's how much digital content the country is consuming. So it, I, I kind of get it. Uh, but why don't they just make them charge, you know, HST or GST and PST, depending where you're you're living? Yeah, right. I wonder the same thing. It seems like that would be um, an easy thing to do. But perhaps they're worried about consumer backlash. Because do you know how outraged people get every time their Netflix bill goes up by a dollar or two? They don't like it. <laughs> no. So, it, you know, as soon as the Liberal Party says we're going to tax... Netflix, 13%, the Conservative Party can turn to and say the Liberal Party is making your Netflix bill more expensive. And in the political world, those sort of issues that affect your wallet are really effective. There'll be riots in the street. Well, uh, okay, so just stepping back here again, it, from a fair, okay, I don't want to pay more tax, you know, trust me, but it's not fair if if the cable companies have to charge tax, like the full the full amount, why does Netflix get away with not having to pay tax? Even, even we're so, kind of we're almost kind of subsidizing them. Yeah, but there's even some some things you can buy on Amazon that you don't get taxed on. I'm like, how does that work? Depends where they're shipping from. Right, but I'm still buying it in Canada, shipping to my Canadian address, which yeah. is basically what Brian's point with the digital stuff is as well. Netflix isn't based in Canada, but they're showing content in Canada. Yeah. So and they're making a truckload of money off Canadians. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's all logical, but these com these companies are not based in operating in Canada and they're delivering services here, which under a free trade agreement, we have to allow into the country. Yeah. We have to allow consumers to access, right? So this is the international conundrum that's been created with the advent of digital delivery of services, you know, over the top services that we can get and don't really depend directly on the infrastructure. Like you think about it, cable, that depends, that's directly linked to the infrastructure through which you receive it, right? So these companies that built, invested in the cable, operate the cable system, deliver the content. And therefore, they're, they're here in Canada. They have to be to, in order to make that work. Uh, the companies that are delivering these digital services, they get to float on top of that infrastructure and uh, they don't have to be here in Canada because of that mechanism of delivery, right? So, you know, it's it's a worldwide problem. Like I say, the, around the world, people are saying we have to harvest, start to harvest some revenue from all of these American companies that are successfully um, making millions of dollars out of our citizenry. Well, I, I guess an example, though, John, if I bought uh, some sneakers uh, from Amazon.com, like down in the U.S., delivered out of Washington State, they're not going to charge me GST. On, no, no. no you, so this is the same type of thing, really, when we're yeah, saying, yeah. you know, Netflix is not charging. catch it at the border, right? Because yeah. sometimes you, it, the package that goes through yeah, Canada right. Post will get that uh, duty. But even that's not even consistent. <laughs> no, there's not a consistency there. Yeah. No. So is this is this going to be a reality then, Brian? Yeah, it looks like since the Liberals... Uh, did get the minority government and they could be supported in this bill by the NDP that would easily pass the House. And uh, this is one thing that they can do that uh, would help for, to pay for some of their other platform promises. So um, I, th I would expect that they'll have it done very quickly. We've been talking with Brian Jackson from the Infotech Research Group out of uh, Toronto. Thanks for joining us, Brian. 
Thanks for having me. Let's talk social media platforms and specifically one that I think a few people use that are much younger than we are. <laughs> uh, not a lot of people have heard of, uh, perhaps. It's called TikTok. And uh, to help us understand what it's all about and why the U.S. government uh, is a little concerned about it, we've got our good friend Shruti Shikar from Mobile Syrup. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Mike. I appreciate it. I wanted to bring you on because uh, I was hoping you could explain TikTok better than I could. <laughs> I mean, I can try. I'm not on TikTok, but I, I have seen several videos and they're, they're pretty fun. So explain to uh, the, the listeners, uh, what, what is the general premise behind TikTok? Um, I would say that they're 15 second long, um, kind of like looped videos uh, that you can edit and play some fun music on it. You could do voiceovers. Um, there are cat videos, dog videos. It's just, it's just a really, I would say, more millennial version of Vine, uh, which died a few years ago, as you as you might remember. Um, but I, I think the purpose of it is just, it's, it's just supposed to be fun um, and, and entertaining for people. Um, there are, I think there are two sides of TikTok. I think you've got the fun, you know, cat, uh, cat loops videos um, and, and, you know, like teen videos, if you will. Um, but then there's also another side that I've, I've kind of been noticing a lot on TikTok and some of the videos I've seen. Um, and, and those are more serious in, in nature where uh, students might be, I guess, if there's like a protest happening, they might even encourage others to join the protest, um, whether the protest has to do with climate change or maybe it's like a strike to have better education for for teachers and students. So th there's definitely two sides to TikTok. Um, but I think the, the general purpose of it is is the short loop videos. Sort of like the snack size little video clips that you can consume really quickly uh, throughout your day. Yeah, like I would even, I, I mean, I, I really think that these are just super, like they're supposed to be super relatable, super fun. Um, I, I really don't think that, I mean, I mean, some people actually put a lot of thought and energy into their videos, but I think the majority of people are just having fun with it. If you look at some of the stats, uh, they've got 26.5 million active users in the U.S., and 60% of those are between the ages of 16 and 24. So it does skew heavily on the uh, the, the younger side. Uh, Chinese company behind it. And uh, as you know, the U.S. government and uh, the Chinese government aren't playing nice uh, together right now. And a lot of uh, politicians on the U.S. side are concerned about uh, security when it comes to TikTok. Uh, is this more posturing or do you think there's some serious security issues with TikTok? And fifteen second uh, bite sized videos. I mean, I I don't I don't know. Uh, so yeah, I I do understand that there's this inquiry that's um, being uh, taken upon by the the U.S. government, um, and and their premise uh, around the concern is that TikTok is sharing um, information with the government. Obviously, it's owned by a Chinese company, uh, ByteDance. Um, which actually acquired a uh, music musically. I, I don't know if I said that correctly, but um, so basically, it's a Chinese company that owns owns TikTok, and um, I think I think it goes back to this um, the concern of, of whether or not companies that are owned by by China have to follow Chinese regulation, even if they're operating elsewhere outside of the country. Um, but TikTok has suggested or, or has confirmed that whatever content is created in the U.S. will stay in the U.S., like the U.S. platform of it. So I think that's really where the, the concern comes from. And, and some of this sharing of information could be, um, you know, personal data. Uh, and a lot of young people are on it, you know, like teenagers, um, definitely underage children are on it for sure. So I think that that's where part of the concern comes from. And then, you know, you could solicit people to, to use TikTok for for getting information. I don't know how you would do that with a 15 second loop video, but like, I think that's also where the concern comes from as well. Well, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I've been reading up a, a bit about it. Uh, the Washington Post had a great article as well. Uh, there's concerns about the censoring of, uh, of the videos, uh, especially when it comes to the China side. Uh, you know, we are all watching what's happening in Hong Kong. Apparently, a lot of those TikTok videos have been censored by the, the company. Uh, the company TikTok keeps saying that they are separate from the Chinese government, yet they're censoring 
uh, obviously politically motivated uh, videos. Uh, there's also been rumors uh, that uh, they also censor, um, you know, gay videos uh, as as well. Uh, so you know, obviously that's not adhering to our Western uh, values. Uh, so I can see why there is some concern uh, there. But um, you know, I just wonder if uh, you know they will be continued to. Uh, be able to, you know, enter the U.S. market. I know that acquisition you talked about is under review uh, by uh, the government in in the U.S. Yeah, I, and again, I don't, I don't know if they'll continue. I mean, I think again, whenever hearings take place, um, business is usually still as usual. Um, it, it will still probably continue until a final decision has been made. I, I don't even, I'm not entirely sure what will actually happen or how that will even. Happen and, and again, I think you know some of the concern or not concern, but one some of the the thought process behind this um, that I've kind of heard from some experts is is that you know this is this goes again with the whole issue of U.S. having a trade relationship crisis with China, and that kind of brings about a lot of other issues like you know uh, Huawei and and whether or not Huawei should be banned in, in the U.S. or not, and so I think. You know, this is again because it's a China-based company. Uh, it goes with that whole idea, like the U.S. almost fighting back against China. So I, I mean, it all really depends on what's going to happen with China and the relationship that the U.S. will have with that country, um, and and the trade relations that that may or not may or not be affected in the future, and and how um, the U.S. President Donald Trump feels about the country. So it, it's really a I think there's there's a lot of questions right now, and um, I think a lot of people have those questions. I certainly can't answer them because I don't know all the answers. I wish I did, but um, I think we would find out in the future if, if there is, a, I guess, life of TikTok in the U.S. It, it sounds just like, like you said, it's just a lot of posturing uh, because of the trade crisis and the fact that it's just one more uh, piece of ammo for the Trump administration to sort of hold over China, threatening this, you know, extremely popular company uh, that's trying to go global. Yeah. And, and so I think, uh, I think that's where really it kind of stems from. I, I don't want to speculate and say that exactly is the reason, but I think that's what some analysts are suggesting. That's where uh, this security review is coming from, just because, you know, there's, there's a lot of human rights issues and concerns and past violations that the U.S. Ha- or sorry, rather not U.S. Uh, that China has made, um, and so I think that's where that concern really comes from. And I guess this could also extend to other apps that are cross-border, like WhatsApp and and things like that, where there's lots of users using it, especially uh, away from mainland China. Well, WhatsApp is it would I, I maybe you meant WeChat? Oh, WeChat. Um, sorry, yes. Yes. Yeah, because WhatsApp is is the other thing, yeah, but very similar sounding yeah. name for yeah. sure. But yeah, I definitely think WeChat would fall under the same realm. Um, you know, in Canada at least, we there are several institutions that accept WeChat as a form of payment. As as if some listeners might not be aware, but WeChat is a very popular messaging app and that's used in China, and it's kind of used for everything. You know, not just. Uh, chatting with your friends, but you know you could get homeless things on WeChat. You can, it's it's basically like it's basically like your all encompassing hub for everything. Like your payment system is on there. You're you go into a taxi cab. You could you can actually just pay through your WeChat. And so um, similar to that, they've kind of brought that app to Canada and, and other places in the world. And a lot of um, West Asians living in Western Canada or in the West, uh, so in Canada and, and North America, they use WeChat. And so it's very possible that WeChat would also maybe go through the same circumstance. I haven't heard anything. Could it happen? Very possible. I, I Again, I, I, I don't want to speculate, but who knows? We're talking with Shruti Shakar from MobileSyrup.com. It is a fantastic website for finding out all your mobile news and the latest deal on uh, cell phone plans as well. And uh, with Black Friday coming up, uh, it's probably one of the best times of the year to uh, look into potentially changing your plan. And again, MobileSyrup.com has got uh, all that information. Thanks for joining us, Shruti. Thanks for having me, Mike. Time for one more app. It's the game app of the week. Graham, what do we got? Uh, This week, we've got Spaceland. And if you are an Apple Arcade subscriber for your, I think it's $6 a month-ish, this is free. It's included in your subscription. That's another thing you have on your subscription list. (laughs) (laughs) Fact. 
Um, so th this is a really cool game. It is a uh, an isometric perspective, real time strategy, turn based game. So this is a game where you've got this sort of like this overhead view. You run a team of uh, space fighters and they're going out there to fight aliens. They've got plasma guns, machine guns and cover. And so this is actually reminiscent of an old school game called XCOM. So if you have XCOM in your gaming history anywhere and you're like, wow, I'd really love to play a game like that again. Uh, this is available for you. It works on Mac. It works on Apple TV. It works on your iPad and works on your iPhone and plays great on all of them. And if you don't want to use touch controls, uh, it's also controller ready. Very cool. Spaceland. Spaceland, available with your Apple Arcade subscription. So all the time we have left, don't forget to hit our website, www.getconnectedmedia.com. Got our video podcasts up there. I want to thank the crew that put this together. Stephen, John, Graham, and Christina, who's somewhere on the globe. Over the I think, rainbow. I think in Egypt right now. We'll see you again next time. <laughs>